Um, first of all, I'd like uh, to convey um, sincere apologies from Dr. Ravi Singh, who is not able to make up for this conference, and uh, has kindly agreed um, to actually uh, propose me to do the presentation on his behalf. Um, so, uh, at the same time, I'd also like to uh, thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to present some of the work. The progress that has been made um, in terms of stem rust breeding um, since the inception of this project 10 years ago. Um, so the title of today's presentation is Breeding Durable Red Brand Resistance to Stem Rust um, within the Spring Wheat uh, Breeding Program at Summit. Um, the progress that has been made um, over the decade since the launch of BGRI uh, and DRRW projects in 2008. Um, so um, the work is done by the whole um, Global Wheat Program group, um, which is within the Spring Bread Wheat Program. Um, I'll start off um, trying to introduce a little bit on um, the activities within the Summit Global Wheat Program. Um, the main objective of the wheat breeding um, within Summit um, is to provide improved germplasm, which is not only high yielding, but also stable across environments. And at the same time, um, globally adapted, uh, combines uh, um, resistance uh, which is durable against uh, pests and diseases and at the same time uh, combining um, stress tolerance as well as quality parameters. Um, the target area for us is about 60 million hectares and uh, this 60 million hectares could be subclassified into four different mega environments. Uh, the first is the irrigated mega environment um, which is uh, spanning about 30 million hectares. Um, the mega environment two which is a high rainfall area which is close to about 5 million hectares. Um, Semi-arid uh, mega environment four, which is close to about 15 million hectares, and irrigated warmer environments, which is the mega environment five, which spans about 10 million hectares. Um, Summit disputes its uh, germplasm globally, as I've indicated, and the global impacts have been tremendous over the last 10 years. As you can see from the slide, the impacts that uh, the CG um, IAR has made in terms of uh, developing germplasm that has been released to our global partners. Um, I'll take the specific case in one of the studies that has been done by Atlantican, um, looking at the uh, progress that has been made in the last 10 years. As you can see, um, about half of the varieties that are released in South Asia, Southeast Asia, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southwest Asia, um, are more than half of the varieties that are released are actually Simit or CGR Delive, which includes Ikada as well. And at the same time, um, close to about 30% of the materials that are released um, globally um, would have a uh, summit parent in their pedigree. So summit has played a tremendous role in terms of uh, creating impacts, um, providing valuable germplasm, um, not only as direct releases, but also as uh, pre-breeding materials um, to provide them with a great genetic resource. Whom do we work for? Um, we work for farmers especially the ones in the developing countries. And Simmet's mission and vision um, is to alleviate hunger and poverty in developing countries. So this is a typical example of an Ethiopian farmer who is considered to be a small-scale, small-hole farmer who are resource poor. Um, targeted area is less than two hectares of land um, who have got limited um, resources for inputs. And at the same time, are also prone to environmental vagaries. In the scenario of climate change, you experience a lot of drought, um, intermittent rainfalls, at the same time, unpredictable climate change. Um, and at the same time, um, these uh, farmers do not have access to improved seeds because um, they are not uh, accessing um, better uh, varieties that have been released, or at the same time, they do not have good private sector in place or seed systems in place wherein they could have access to better improved varieties. Um, and at the same time, um, a lack of uh, inputs and resources in, a, in order to utilize fungicides in order to protect their crop. So usually they are resource poor in terms of um, advocating um, the use of fungicides to protect their crops, except for the fact in emergencies when they realize the fact that it's just going beyond control. So um, they are our target audience. Um, we are trying to sort of breed for resistance so as to not only emphasize on being eco-friendly, but also providing alternative options to increase um, the yield gains in farmers' fields, especially the small-scale farmers, but also to ensure um, durability in terms of um, the traits that we're looking at. Um, coming back to the priorities within the bread wheat program, as you can see, um, we can sort of classify them into core traits and then traits based on mega environments. Um, the core traits, um, as I already mentioned, um, high yield is a driving force, um, but also ensuring that it is stable across environments. 
Um, the current uh, annual yield gain is close to about 1%, uh, but we need to drive it down to about 1.6% um, so as to meet the global food challenges uh, by 2050. The key priority traits uh, at the moment, and al always has been with Summit, is uh, durable resistance to rust. All the three rust, stem rust, leaf rust, and yellow rust, but special emphasis, um, knowing of the situation of what's going on in Africa, and uh, the UG99 group of races, which are considered to be a global threat, seems to be one of the most important aspects uh, in terms of breeding for durable resistance. Um, other areas that we're looking at is water use efficiency and drought tolerance. And at the same time, um, we're also looking at uh, heat tolerance um, in order to develop early maturing varieties. And we're also aware of the fact that one degree rise in temperature can also drastically reduce the yields by 10%. So um, this is uh, some of the area that has been focused on uh, Southeast Asia. And at the same time, we're also looking at enhancing uh, the end use quality by having um, high quality protein wheat um, with added attributes of milling and baking characteristics. Um, with the uh, global challenge of uh, micronutrient deficiency, we've got Harvest Plus, which is dealing exclusively with biofortified wheat in order to enhance the iron and zinc levels within the cement germplasm that is distributed globally in the developing countries. Looking at the other emerging issues within the mega environments, um, we're also looking at um, septoria to decide blotch, which is an important uh, disease in the mega environment too. Um, spot blotch, tan spot, fusarium head scab uh, in mega environments two and five. Um, carnal burnt in mega environment one. And at the same time, we're also looking at um, root-borne diseases um, as well as nematodes, which fall under mega environment four. So the cement weed breeding program um, is not very specific to certain traits, but as a package of traits that we would wish to incorporate into our weed breeding germplasm that is distributed as international germplasm um, globally. So um, emphasis has been made, to, um, and the germplasm is selected based on the necessities in the different geographical regions of the environments that we work with, um, trying to address those target issues. Uh, coming back to um, the Stemra status, um, a lot of information has been generated in terms of pathogenic diversity and at the same time a um, lot of advancement that has come up in understanding the race structure within the UG99 lineage. So this is just to give a bit of a comparison, as you could see, um, since the um, last previous decade, um, in 2005 we had uh, just information about two races uh, in, in the African environment. Now we have come up with um, a better understanding and we have characterized about 11 races within the UG99 lineage. And it's not about just the um, race, but also in terms of the spread of the race within the geographical regions, as you could see, um, has expanded uh, since the initial detection of UG99 in Uganda, all the way to South Africa in the south and all the way up to Middle East and Iran uh, in 2007. So this information has been quite vital to actually strategize and um, uh, sort of channelize our breeding activities in terms of gene deployment and uh, in terms of enhancing uh, and combining both yield as well as um, stem rust resistance in our breeding materials. A lot of progress has been made, uh, but then um, the setbacks are always there. So we had a recent uh, breakdown of two of the most important uh, varieties, one in Kenya and one in Ethiopia. Um, Robin, which was uh, deployed widely in Kenya, um, was quite high yielding and carried this gene called SRTMP. And unfortunately, last year, um, this gene broke down due to um, virulence uh, to this race TMP, uh, to the gene TMP by um, races TTKTT and uh, TTKTK. So the one, um, the TTKTK carries virulence for SRTMP, and the other race carries combined virulence for both SRTMP as well as SR24. Um, so that's, that's another important uh, aspect wherein one of the genes which is quietly, widely deployed, occupying about 40% of the area in Kenya, has broken down. And similar was the case with Ethiopia with the breakdown of uh, uh, the variety Digalu which carried TMP. However, the race was not within the UG99 lineage, was uh, a race with a foreign incursion, which was widely prevalent in other regions of East Africa and uh, other parts of Africa. Um, so, um, the localized epidemics have been happening, uh, however, we're still under control, um, not much of damage, but still precautionary measures in terms of advocating fungicides was, um, was done during these um, localized epidemics. But the let lesson learned out of this was um, how to strategize and how to look way forward in terms of addressing these emerging challenges. 
So um, yesterday we have seen a great video that was done by Chris Knight um, in terms of explaining the shuttle breeding system and uh, the importance of shuttle breeding in, uh, in CIMIT in terms of incorporating resistance to STEMRAS UG99. So um, trying to take the advantage of um, the shuttle breeding which was done by Dr. Bolog in 1940s, trying to um, have uh, uh, materials uh, which are broadly adapted um, in two different environments, um, that is in Ciudad Obregón and as well as in Toluca, um, and also addressing different um, traits um, such as um, resistance to local races of leaf rust, um, stem rust in um, Obregon along with um, higher yield potential and water use efficiency and at the same time for yellow rust, um, septoria as well as fusarium in Toluca in two different environments. So basically um, producing um, weed germplasm which was broadly adapted photo period insensitive um, which could be adapted in different geographical regions of the world. So taking the advantage of having this shuttle breeding and also reducing these, um, the breeding cycle by half and trying to incorporate resistance against um, Stemras UG99. Um, in 2006, we initiated the Summit Kenya shuttle breeding system of knowing of the fact that the phenotyping platform in Kenya was perfectly an opportunity um, to incorporate by transferring the breeding materials uh, for selection in an environment which was favoring the disease. So um, we initiated the shuttle breeding um, as early as 2008, when the first round of materials were coming down for selection. Um, as you could see, people um, trying to select materials. Uh, the methodology that we follow is the single backcross selected bulk technique. Um, two generations of testing to ensure that uh, there's adequate levels of resistance in the materials that have been selected at the population stage in both F3 and F4 segregating generations. And at the same time, every year we annually receive close to about 2,000 segregating populations um, for selections in Kenya. Um, uh, and the advanced stage at F6 and F7 goes back to Obregon. Um, the first materials of this shuttle breeding um, started to come out uh, in as early as 2011 when they were started being distributed as international nurseries. So um, the take home message from having this kind of shuttle breeding was of the fact that um, you're not addressing one specific issue, but also integrating that specific issue into the entire wheat breeding program, which also looks at a multiple of traits um, that we focus back at Summit in Mexico. Um, so this is just to summarize um, the activities that we do within the shuttle breeding system. Um, as I was mentioning, um, F3 and F4 segregating populations come down uh, for testing um, during the month of off-season, which is uh, between January and May. Um, the selected heads are harvested, bulked, and then replanted the following season. Um, in, which is called as the main season, which is a day F5 generation. And the selected heads are again harvested and bulked and are sent back to Obregon. So this two, re two seasons of testing ensures the fact that we have selected materials which query adequate levels of resistance against the stem rust races that are present in Joro. And at the same time, um, advanced lines uh, which undergo yield testing, the first year of yield tests that have been done in Obregon, um, close to about 8,000 entries are also screened down in Kenya. Um, and most of the lines which do not uh, perform as high yielders are actually um, culled off. And uh, we come up with another set of 1,400 lines, um, which I evaluated for um, other diseases and other traits uh, back in Mexico, which include uh, stem rust and other agronomic traits. And uh, a further subset of 1,100 within the remaining um, advanced lines are promoted for the second year round of yield trials under six different environments. And uh, the best selected materials combining um, performance against other traits and diseases are the ones that are promoted as international nurseries. So um, the focus is mostly based on field evaluations, but uh, also of the fact that a subset of the population, which we know based on our field uh, testing, if they are known to carry any race-specific genes, are actually phenotyped uh, or race-typed at CDL um, to sort of characterize and confirm the presence of those race-specific genes. So this entire information makes us informed decisions in terms of promoting the lines which carry um, adult plant resistance genes or a combination of adult plant resistance genes and race specific genes in combination. So um, in, in summary, a four seasons of testing in Kenya provides the right environment, also gives us a confidence of the fact that the materials that have been selected, even at the early generations as F3 and F4 and at the advanced generations, carry adequate levels of resistance which are distributed as international nurseries globally. 
Um, this is to summarize um, the screening nurseries, uh, well, the international nurseries that have been distributed in 2015. As you can see, um, there is um, high uh, or adequate levels of uh, resistance in the APR category, close to about 44.8% of the materials um, within the cement materials carry um, adequate levels of um, adult plant resistance, a combination of three to four minor genes, um, which are additive in effect, um, uh, carrying um, high levels of resistance, and at the same time, we also have uh, close to about 29% of materials carrying very specific resistance. So the strategy is to have a combination of several APR genes, and at the same time, have a combination of both um, race specific genes, which are 13, 25, 26, 42, and few other um, newly characterized genes in combination that can enhance the durability of resistance within the cement breeding materials. And one thing that I wanted to emphasize is we've heard a lot of uh, stories about uh, McFadden's work um, uh, in the last session, uh, which talked also about uh, incorporating stem rust resistance using uh, SR2 gene. So this was deployed as early as 1920. So as you could recall back, the gene has been effective for almost a decade, uh, for nine decades, sorry, about 90 years, or closing to about 100 years. So these are some kind of genes that we would actually want to breed in our materials, and um, Borlaug had actually used um, SR2 extensively uh, in, in addressing the challenges of stem rust when he was in Summit, Mexico. So um, at this stage, what you could also confirm back is um, SR2 forms the backbone of several of our Summit materials. Um, having this SR2 gene uh, in several of our materials, close to about 80% uh, that has been within the breeding pipeline. And at the same time, our goal is to sort of um, build up on this SR2 complex, SR2 in combination with other APR genes, as well as mage genes in combination to reach to a level of near immune kind of response, which could be very useful to deploy them in regions of East Africa, wherein we have new emerging virulences. Um, one of the interesting things that we've observed, uh, comparing the Mexican shuttle breeding as well as incorporating the Summit uh, Kenya-Mexico shuttle breeding, um, as you can see, um, there has been a, a yield advantage um, over the Mexican shuttle breeding. Um, we were able to identify a larger frequency of lines that carried um, um, higher yields combining um, stem rust resistance um, compared to the mean uh, with the Czech rolls that was used in 2013 and 2014. So um, this was one of the um, advantages of have also having a parallel shuttle breeding uh, approach and then making a comparison with the Mexican shuttle breeding. So we were coming up with lines which combined both yield as well as resistance. Um, right now, we've changed our check to Borlaug 100, which was released last year. Um, that has 9% yield advantage over Rolls. However, we were still able to identify a smaller frequency of lines, and we are coming up with better crosses with Borlaug 100 to drive the yield gain, and at the same time, um, have resistance to stem rust as well. Um, this is uh, just to reflect back on the progress that we've made in terms of the nurseries that have been distributed across and then the progress also within the developing countries. So this is just a comparison of the data that we had from uh, the screening nurseries in Joro um, last season. Um, as you can see, there's an uh, increased frequency of materials that fall under um, um, resistant categories, which are um, acceptable levels uh, for uh, deployment in the national performance testing. And I think the special focus is in terms of Ethiopia, wherein we've got larger frequency of lines that are resistant, which could be either cement derived or Ricarda derived, and having adequate levels of resistance, which are now in the national program for release and testing. Coming back to what kind of breeding options have we got um, within cement materials, as you could see, um, the race specific genes that I've uh, mentioned earlier, um, we've got uh, 22, SR22, SR25, 26, 33, 45, floating around um, in different gene combinations in different genetic backgrounds. And at the same time, we also have new uncharacterized genes which are in unadapted backgrounds which needs uh, further efforts to bring them back into breeding program. And at the same time, we're also looking at uh, stacking multiple um, race-specific genes, combinations of SR25, SR22, and SR26. The only challenge of having such kind of stacks is of the fact that when you make crosses, there's a chance of um, segregation, and then you, you end up losing the gene stacks um, in combination. 
Um, and at the same time, we're also looking at um, having a cisgenic approach of uh, building gene cassettes wherein we can have two to three um, race-specific genes along with a few APR genes in combinations as a whole linkage block, which can be transferred as a single Mendelian trait without losing the efficacy of any of the genes that are being in, used in combination. Um, one take home message um, uh, with regards to the Stemras genes, which are race specific and are effective against the UG99 race group, uh, most of them do not fall under the near immune category. So they do not condition a clean infection type response either at seedling stage or at the field um, evaluation stage. So uh, most of the genes that are effective are intermediate types, and uh, having such background APR genes actually enhances the phenotypic effect of some of these intermediate genes. And that has been observed largely in simid germplasm, and it was quite well um, documented by Robert the other day, wherein he was talking about LR24 um, being durable with the presence of, uh, sorry, LR24 being durable in the presence of um, LR34, which was deployed in Australia. So there are different strategies of deployment. So either having a combination of uh, three to four minor genes, which can enhance in an additive fashion to come up with uh, the same levels of resistance as major genes, or having a combination of both, or combining two to three major genes. Um, in terms of APR genes, um, apart from SR2, uh, the first gene that was identified still being effective, um, we've got a better understanding of some of our pleiotrophic genes, um, LR34, LR46, and also the um, pleiotrophic effects on stem rust. So we've identified four new genes, which is SR55, 56, 57, and 58, in different backgrounds, along with a few other new QTLs on chromosomes 2BS and 5BL. Um, I think most of you are aware of the fact that uh, SR2 within cement materials also has the um, expression of pseudo black chaff, the morphological trait linked to this gene, um, quite prevalent within most of the cement germplasm that has been developed. And a um, lot of effort has been put in restoring the SR2 complex, which I already mentioned, uh, trying to combine SR2 with some of those pleiotrophic loci, which can enhance the levels of resistance within uh, the cement germplasm. Um, some of the other examples on mapping studies um, in identifying new, t new QTLs for stem rust resistance, the one which was presented by Matthew um, yesterday, and at the same time, uh, some of the studies uh, which were done by the same group um, trying to identify QTLs, they report uh, 10 new QTLs in different chromosome regions um, during the biparental and uh, nested association mapping studies uh, by Prabhi Nital and his group. Um, similar were the studies that were done on a set of uh, uh, lines uh, which were used for association mapping studies at Cornell University. Um, in, in, in association with uh, the group, uh, we were identifying several loci which were conferring both race-specific as well as adult plant resistance, um, dating back to the publication in 2011. Um, coming back to um, the lines that we have in our breeding program um, that we're using extensively as being stocks uh, for um, adult plant resistance, I think many of us have uh, already heard of this. Um, Kingbird still continues to be one of the best sources of adult plant resistance, um, which has been released as a variety in Kenya. And um, last year, um, well, early this year, was also released as uh, a variety in Ethiopia. The unfortunate thing about King, Kingbird is um, it's got excellent source of APRs, but at the same time uh, does not um, yield higher as other varieties. But uh, we've come up with new products which combine old, tall Kenyan varieties, which are uh, uh, with the Kenyan uh, background, which include Kenya Fahari, Kachu, um, which also have enhanced levels of resistance, and also um, lines combining Kiritati, which have got resistance if fusarium has applied. So um, a lot of progress has been made. The first round of materials had adequate levels of resistance which were deployed in our breeding programs, but we are coming up with newer and newer materials uh, which combine better um, levels of resistance um, than what it was in the past. Um, and at the same time, we are closely monitoring and also looking at uh, incorporating the resistance coming down from uh, the old Kenyan varieties which were found to be resistant as early as 2006 when we were testing against the UG99 race group and still hold against the new races as well. Uh, so some of those uh, stocks are uh, Kenya Swara, Kenya Nangumi, um, Kenya Kudu, um, and Kenya Fahari, which are quite extensively used. And um, we're trying to repackage some of these materials w in higher adapted backgrounds so as to release them back in Kenya um, to be one of those varieties. Um, this is uh, another example of uh, some of the mapping studies that was done back in Mexico, trying to identify 13 different loci conferring um, resistance uh, against the UG99 race group. Um, the one that, that I wanted to emphasize was the four preotrophic loci, which I just described about um, SR58 on chromosome 1B, SR2 loci on 3B, 
um, SR55 uh, on chromosome 40, um, 56 on 5B, and uh, uh, SR57 on uh, chromosome 7B. So these pleiotrophic loci have uh, been quite common in uh, Simmet germplasm. At the same time, combination with SR2 have actually increased the um, phenotypic effect uh, against Demrast. Uh, one of the emerging challenges which we've been discussing today is the prevalence of this aggressive traces of Stremras um, globally and which has been a concern for our summit breeding program as well. Um, so um, the characteristic traits of these um, aggressive races has been um, early infection, faster disease buildup, lower latency period in terms of um, sort of uh, spreading across rapidly, and at the same time adapting under warmer temperatures as well and in areas wherein there's no reports of yellow rust in the past. So um, added to those traits are faster evolution of these new, uh, races for new virulences and at the same time reduced efficacy of most of the resistance genes that have been deployed um, globally. So there's an increasing emerging concern of addressing this global challenge of yellow rust that is coming up uh, in the recent times. It is just a resurgence of what it was in the past. And uh, one of the important uh, highlights has been uh, reported in this paper, which was reported by Ali um, of uh, Himalayas being the center of origin for diversity of yellow rust within the South Asian region. So the take home message for this is to urgently um, replace varieties which are susceptible and at the same time need to develop and deploy varieties which carry adequate levels of resistance against yellow rust and also to eliminate the susceptible varieties. So a couple of key points to emphasize within the cement breeding materials, we've got combination of four to five minor genes, um, which also provide resistance against different growth stages uh, within the um, weed germplasm, so as to provide adequate resistance all throughout the life cycle of the plant. And at the same time, triggering off the APRs to function by the time the disease starts appearing in the field. And also a combination of approaches in terms of gene deployment, wherein you can use the intermediate race-specific genes for yellow rust and also combine them with adult plant resistance so as to increase the um, level of resistance. Some new genes that have been identified um, are chromosome uh, 2BS, wherein we've got uh, a YRF uh, from the population Francolin, and then a few of the APR genes, YR54 in Kwayu. Uh, YR60 in Lal Bahadur and YR67 in Sujata populations, which were mapped very recently by some of our colleagues. And um, this is the status of yellow rust in the nurseries that have been distributed in 2015. As you can see, um, there is a comparison of uh, the performance of some of these lines that were tested in Toluca, two seasons of Joro, and then in Ludhiana. As you can see, uh, there is a larger frequency of lines that are actually resistant to the disease. Uh, falling under this category of 0 to 1. And at the same time, if you were to look at the seedling reaction type, they show um, a, a broad array of infection types. So uh, most of the genes uh, that confer resistance against yellow rust also are a combination of these intermediate genes with um, APR genes in the background or a combination of several APR genes in some of those lines. Uh, similar with the case of uh, leaf rust as well, a lot of progress has been made. Um, as you can see, um, there is uh, a large frequency of lines that carry adult plant resistance, close to about 408 lines, and some race-specific genes as well. One thing take-home message is close to about 60% of the lines that are distributed every year carry levels of resistance, which is as good as the race-specific uh, genes conferring resistance. So we have reached to a stage of near immunity, combining um, race non-specific genes or APR genes uh, which condition similar kind of response as good as the race-specific genes. And similar is the same approach that we're trying to use for breeding against stem rust. And at the end of the day, um, we've talked about uh, the traits, but then the ultimate yield, uh, the driver is, is the yield potential. And as you can see, the progress that has been made in terms of incorporating traits and also combining yield, um, just to make a comparison uh, with Rolfs that was released in 2007, and then we've got Borlaug 100, which was released last year, there's been a significant increase, about 9% increase in yield gains um, over the last um, 10 year, uh, over the last seven years. And similar is the case with our partners who have actually deployed some of the summit varieties wherein we have experienced 1% um, at least a yield gain every year. So, um, in summary, um, there's been a 1% annual increase um, in yield um, uh, over the last decade. Um, and this has uh, been significantly achieved because of the increased investments in breeding, um, especially um, through the Gates Foundation, um, GRDC, CESA Project, Harvest Plus Project, and few others. And at the same time, um, integrating breeding for yield potential, combining stress tolerance and disease resistance. Um, better targeting of crosses and also integrating phenotyping platforms so as to um, evaluate and test and also select better and, uh, and better germplasm in different environments. 
and at the same time expanded yield testing. I think uh, the previous presenter also emphasized on the fact that phenotyping is the key to um, sort of breeding success. And uh, expanded yield testing gives you an advantage to select uh, more transgressive segregants that combine different traits in different environments. Um, so uh, over the last decade, I think um, since the um, last 10 years, um, I think the expansion has gone fourfold from 2,000 um, entries that were used in the first year of uh, testing to close to about 8,000 entries that are being currently um, done in Ciudad Obregón. And at the same time, 1,000 entries um, the second year of field trials, which are um, sort of tested across six different environments. And um, the impact, um, as we're looking at, is uh, several nurseries that have been distributed uh, globally. Uh, the first one um, that we're looking at are the yield trials, um, which comprise the yield spring wheat trials, S wheat, saw wheat, the high rainfall, as well as the heat tolerance wheat yield trials. And at the same time, we've got uh, screening nurseries, uh, which include the IBWSN um, semi arid wheat screening nursery, as well as high rainfall the wheat screening nursery, close to about 250 to 300 lines. So these are targeting different mega environments and also trace bait nurseries, um, such as disease resistant nurseries, ICEPTON um, nurseries for leaf bright, stem rust, fusarium, as well as carnal bunt. Um, one take home message from this one is of the fact that uh, we distribute close to about 100 to 150 sets every year. Um, which has been um, sort of 40 to 50 percent increase um, in terms of the number of lines that we distribute to our collaborators. So there's increased demand for cement nurseries um, within our global partners. And finally, um, in terms of the impact that uh, the project has made over the last 10 years, we've got about 60 varieties and advanced lines that have been released in different parts of the world. And as you can see, um, it's been done in collaboration with other CG centers as well as national partners. So that's a tremendous impact in delivering out outputs in a short span of time of six to eight years that we could scale out and um, sort of um, produce um, close to about 60 varieties um, released in different countries. So um, to conclude, um, Simit uh, Spring Wheat Program will continue to deliver producing germplasm, which is combining high yield potential at the same time uh, combining traits of disease resistance. Um, and also, as I'd already mentioned, uh, there is significant diversity for both race-specific and APR genes, um, and that could be deployed and used for breeding. Um, and at the same time, uh, several new APR loci have been identified, which could be deployed in the East African region where we've got challenges. Um, boom and bust cycles, we may not be able to completely um, stop them in the near future, but we can actually reduce uh, the frequency of occurrence of such boom and bust cycles significantly onto a very endemic scale. And at the same time, uh, stacking of uh, resistant genes as uh, gene cassettes would offer uh, a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, gene deployment of multiple stacks. Uh, one take home message would be to get rid of the susceptible varieties, which has been a key message um, in different sessions, eliminating the rust suckers and also to ensure that uh, we do not have uh, emergence of new races coming through mutations. Finally, I'd like to thank the um, organizers as well as the funding agencies, the Gates Foundation, um, the DRRW project, the CESA project, as well as the Harvest Plus project. Um, Garments, um, the Department for International Development in the UK, um, BMZ, ICR, um, some other institutions in Korea, Mexico, and the USAID and USDA, and farmers organizations, um, AgroAital, GRDC, uh, and Patronato in Mexico. Thank you for your attention.